Welcome to Unlapped. We're back ahead of the Austrian Grand Prix, and we have plenty to discuss as we get ready for the second round of a three back-to-back -back race series. Plus, Nate Saunders has returned from Spain, but before that, he was on jury duty, and that's why he has missed the last couple of weeks. Lawrence Edmondson, of course, Katie George, Nate, welcome back. It's good to see you. Laz and I kind of set the scene in the stage, but we've obviously got some follow-up questions before we break down Spain and then get you a preview ahead of Austria. So what was it like and were you the foreman or not? Because Laz and I decided if we thought you would maybe be a good foreman. Well, I appreciate the compliment and you weren't the only ones. So a few of the <laughs> other jurors, when we came to the deliberate, actually put me forward, which was kind of nice. So really? like, they were like, Nate, you should, one of them was like, you, you seem like a very logical guy, the way you, you know, you set things out. You should be the foreman. And then I was like, I don't mind being the foreman. I'm happy. You know, like the, the thing with that is you have to stand up in court and give the verdict, obviously at the end. But one guy really was like, I really want to be foreman. So oh, I was like, I'm not ambitious. In, I'm not, yeah, I was like, look, I'm not in the game to, I'm not in the jury, the jury duty game to ruin <laughs> anyone else's fun. So I said, yeah, you, you know, you're happy to be. And um, there was one point when we were deliberating that I kind of, I just kind of, like, took accidentally took the lead a little bit, and I was like, well, I think we should do that. And the guy was like, ah, ah, I'll, uh. and so he he took it back. It wasn't intentional, and he was very very good. You know, we we actually had a very good kind of team discussion about it and um it worked well but yeah very interesting process i don't know how many of our listeners have done jury duty i don't think either of you have from our conversations no. before we went on, went on air very interesting and from the uk court point of view very very different to what you see in the american court dramas you know a lot of shouting and i object very very civilized in the uk court almost too civilized one of really? the jurors was upset that you couldn't take coffee into the the jury the jury box which I yeah. found hilarious because, you know, uh, I didn't even think think about it at that point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, uh, I mean, I saying it was good is the wrong thing because, you know, you're there for a very serious reason, but very interesting and a very, a very kind of stressful week. I was kind of keeping Lawrence informed. I didn't book my flight for Spain until the day before because I didn't know when, obviously it was two weeks. And so the I basically was wrap off. Up. Yeah. And you, you, they say you're there for up to 10 days. So I had the Monday before and then we were deliberating into the second week. And as soon as we deliberated in the second week, they kind of said, all right, it was unlikely you'll get put onto another case. So as soon as we finished deliberating, I was kind of free to go. But you just don't know in that in that week before how long you're going to be on the case for. So it's kind of so so I organized everything on the Tuesday, then flew on the Wednesday. So it was kind of a hectic week and I felt it by the, by the end of the week. I'd been rushing around quite a bit. But um yeah, very, very eventful couple of weeks, definitely. Do they wear the wigs? The prosecutors and defense. They do. They do. They do wear the wigs. And the what thing with that? that was one of the guy's wigs. I don't know whether you have to wear the same wig all the time. It just kept slipping off his head. So when he was oh. making decisions, it just wasn't fitting properly. And I was kind of like, man, you know, distracting. Yeah, I just. But I, I think it looks great. And they they wear robes as well, Katie. So it's not just it's not just wigs. It's, it's a wig robe and one of their like and they keep like they keep pulling the robes over their shoulders. Very very grand. And you're in a grand little building in Reading. Um, so yeah, it was it was cool. It was that part of it was kind of interesting to see, and it's all very, very polite. Um, <laughs> I don't know if a UK court drama would be as popular as a, as an American one. I wish the jurors, Laz, had to wear the the wigs as well. <laughs> that would have been entertaining <laughs> as hell. What are you saying about Nate? I think I think Nate looks fantastic <laughs> the way he is. I yes. I dress very I dress very smartly for the occasion. Actually, that so I joked to you guys tonight before we went on air. The whole thing before we went on air like we're live um the whole thing made me realize we'll do it dude, live like, we'll do it live that's uh what's that guy's name bill uh the, <laughs> there's a news anchor that did that um two things quickly on that one is it reinforced the fact never let 12 random people decide your future because you don't know who you're gonna get <laughs> the, the stuff Fair. that some people would wear to the jury but most of like the guys in my case were pretty smart but you'd obviously go into a bigger jury room where everyone is some people was like dressed up like they were going to like a football game or something it was kind of <laughs> If, and if I saw that guy walk into my you know, if Euros I was, are like, going on, so yeah, but you'd you'd look and you're like, oh no, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm screwed. <laughs> so there's a lot of that to it as well, I think, where people just look at you and they make an immediate judgment when they see they see you come in. So, so can you are you able to share with us what kind of case it was? Like what kind of yeah, trial? So, so I picked over the book they give you after. I can say it was a money laundering case. I was juror number twelve on that case. Um and I tried, yeah, I, I I liked the idea of being juror number 12 to all the other jurors. But then after about a day, everyone was like, oh, what, what do you do? 
oh, I'm Nate. And then one of them Googled me and was like, you're quite a big deal. I was like, well, I have a podcast. Doesn't mean I'm, doesn't mean I'm a big deal, but you know, um, but uh, yeah, you can't say too much. So apparently you're not meant to talk about like the verdicts and stuff. Uh, I um, but because I also, I don't think the sentencing of that case has been done yet. So hmm. we probably gave away, actually that's probably given away um, <laughs> what, what the verdicts would have been. But anyway, we can we can get off that before I before I do something. If people if people are water. really invested, I'm sure they could look it up and figure out exactly who we're talking about from a recent trial that just took place. So, yeah, there's I mean there's a lot that take place there. So just any one of them, look at and be right. like that could have been it. Don't worry, you're not on trial here. We're going to talk about some Formula One. Congratulations. <laughs> I don't know why I'm congratulating you, but I feel like you probably <laughs> reached the right verdict with your group. So hopefully that was the case and you guys feel strongly about it. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, like this video, leave us a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to ESPN for more F1 content. And if you're listening, hit us with a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. Where else do you get to listen to Formula One cutting-edge analysis and also get blow-by-blow blow of somebody being on jury duty? I'll just say, we are one <laughs> of like a kind a, here this on is, This is a true crime crossover we're doing without yes. the details of the crime. But Which I would with absolutely all the, love. With all the extra bits. Okay, we're going to break down Spain because you actually were on the ground. Ended up being, I think, a pretty intriguing race. But I will start by saying, bow down to me because I hit the trifecta. <laughs> I saw that. I, I was really impressed. Correctly predicted, okay? Max Verstappen, Lando Norris, Lewis Hamilton, which means not only do I get the three points, gentlemen, I get the trifecta fourth point, and I am now in the lead of the predictions, but we will get to that, our podium predictions at the end. It was a huge race weekend for Lando and McLaren. Laz, you predicted that going into the race. He started on pole, finished the race in second place. Obviously it wasn't the best start. And I think he can only look himself in the mirror. I think he said that afterwards that he felt like he could have won the race if he had started better. What impressed you and what detracted from his performance on the weekend in your mind? What impressed me was the pure performance of the McLaren, which is clearly now a fairly solid rival to Red Bull, even on a circuit where we all assume Red Bull might get the advantage back. So that in itself was was very impressive. And in the race, I think Lando Norris had the fastest car. The issue was that he lost a position to Max at the start and also to George Russell. And then it took him that little bit too long to get past George, probably lost about four seconds or so in that period. And of course, he finished two seconds behind Max. So Clearly, the McLaren had the pace to win, but it goes back to this thing whereby every time Max Verstappen finds himself in a position where he's under pressure, there's a chance that somebody else might beat him, he doesn't have the fastest car, he still finds something deep down to make sure he wins. You know, if you look at the last four races, Imola, Monaco, um, Canada, and then and then Spain, um, okay, Monaco, Red Bull were nowhere. But the other three races he's won, and I think all of them he's won uh, without a clear-cut fastest car like we saw early in the season. So it just goes to show that when Max Verstappen, I think, still inevitably wins this championship, it won't be because he just had the fastest car and it was simple as that. It will be because he ground out these results at this stage. Because if, if he didn't, then we could have a genuine title battle on our hands already. Well, okay, you have an ESPN article up right now about the subject. Lando Norris at this point, I believe is 69 points behind Max Verstappen in the driver's standings. Is it realistic that Lando Norris could possibly catch Verstappen in the title race or you think it's foregone at this point? I mean, it's it's fairly foregone just because it's not like Red Bull have completely lost the thread. Okay, mm -hmm. the developments they brought to the car maybe haven't taken the same kind of steps as, as everyone else and perhaps they haven't even gone that far forward with some of the latest upgrades they've bought. But the starting point was still very high and then Max is still winning these races regardless. So um, I think combine that with the points buffer he already has, something has to go desperately wrong for Red Bull and Max Verstappen to lose 69 points from this, this, this stage. Okay. I mean, you could look at it and it's 14 races and you divide 69 by 14 and it's not actually a huge amount of points that, Lando Norris has to get back at every race, but to do that consistently over and over again against someone as good as Max, that is really tough. So, um, and then combine that with the fact that a number of races we also see uh, the Mercedes looking increasingly competitive, mm -hmm. uh, the Ferrari 
okay, not looking so good in the last two races, but clearly it's going to be good in Baku, Singapore, places like that. It's not like it's guaranteed that at every race, Norris is going to be right up there at the very front without any challenge from other drivers. So it won't take much for a potential victory based on pure pace of the car to turn into fifth place just by a mistake in qualifying or, or something along those lines. So yeah, I, I don't think we've really got a championship challenge on, but what we do have is uncertainty going into pretty much all the remaining races and the possibility that every single one of them is super competitive and exciting to watch, which is not something we had at the start of the season and not something we've had for a few years in Formula 1. Do you feel like, I was having this conversation with somebody a couple of days ago, obviously regulations change in 2026, everybody's working towards those. Do you feel like maybe there should be a longer period of time between those regulation changes, Nate, because it, it feels like, yes, while we didn't have great racing the last few years and it was a Red Bull dominance left and right, Max Verstappen dominance left and right. It feels like maybe now the regulations have kind of sorted themselves out and we have the parity and the balance and great racing that we've been seeking. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we have recent example of this, don't we in 21. Now I know 21 when Red Bull and Mercedes were close, there were, there were some, kind of some tweaks made around the regulations that Mercedes felt had brought Red Bull in, but the core rules stayed the same. Then obviously we had the change and everything kind of, you know, Red Bull was, was super far ahead in 22. We're starting to see the convergence again. And I think we've seen the convergence earlier this time. But yeah, a lot of people said that in the paddock, you know, we've got this kind of this big rule change coming up that everyone's talking about. And it's like, well, actually, things look to be okay at the moment. You know, you've had mm -hmm. one team that had a big advantage, like Lawrence mentioned, hitting diminishing returns now as they're trying to upgrade what was already an incredibly, incredibly quick race car. So yeah, I think, um, especially if we, uh, I tend to agree with what Lawrence said about the championship, you know, it's been a very, very tough thing to see a championship happen from this point. But let's say we do get a classic next year, it will be an exact rerun of what happened then in 21, where you have an amazing season and then you kind of take the wind out of the sails and mm -hmm. it's a bit of a throw of the dice at that point as to who's going to be the dominant team and who isn't. So, yeah, I think there's definitely, but it's it's something that a lot of people in Formula One think now, you know, you need to have stability of regs. You know, you can't make it, you can't see one team dominate for a couple of years and say, right, we need to change the rules again. You've got to just see it out and let it play out. So, yeah, I think that that's something that Formula One needs to, needs to start doing better. Yeah, I, I would agree. I don't know. I just feel like it sometimes it right the ship writes itself in time and it feels like it's done this within these regulations before we head on to change in 2026. Um, there was some drama uh, between the Ferrari drivers and they had some interesting comments post-race. Um, first, Charles Leclerc said on um, Carlos Sainz's early move, it wasn't the moment to fight. He damaged my front wing. I guess he wanted to impress at his home race, considering the moment in his career. Whoa. Mm. Carlos Sainz's response, very spicy. It's too many times that after the race, he complains about something. Double Lad. spicy. Double spicy. I think Carlos, or I thought Charles Leclerc's comment was a little Do you know what I think it was? Spicier. It was before on the grid, they were playing smooth operator on a loop for about 15 minutes. That pissed me off. So Charles Leclerc must have been like, can you stop playing that damn song? <laughs> I was like, you must have another song to play before the anthem. It was just over yeah, and over again. You got your moment in Monaco. Like, let the man, you know, let the man live yeah, that's true. in his home that's race. That's true. Uh, anything to make of this, Laz, or just drivers being drivers? Um, I think there's some truth to Carlos Sainz going out there and trying to beat his teammate. Why, why should he have to sit behind Charles Leclerc? He is, at the moment, on the market for a drive next year. Ferrari made the decision right at the start of the year, before the season started, that they were getting rid of him. I think then you are absolutely entitled to fight for every last position when you're out there because what long game are you playing otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess he'd probably like Ferrari to do reasonably well by the end of the year, but it doesn't actually make any difference to him, does it? He's on his way out. So um, I think uh, Charles may be right in in saying that he's, he's doing it to try and impress uh, other teams but of course he is he absolutely is and so should he be you know so um it all depends on what was said before and how much there was a conversation about right don't fight early on tire saving you know and all that kind of stuff because if you have that in your mind and you're going through the last two corners at the circuit to Catalonia trying to take you know just a little bit of speed out of the car to make sure you're not putting that extra strain on the tires at the end of the lap when we know they're already very very hot then you could make yourself potentially vulnerable to a car behind. So if Leclerc was doing that thinking, well, Carlos is staying where he is. I can understand why there'd be a bit of frustration when Carlos then throws it uh, mm -hmm. into a, into, you know, a fairly tight overtaking move at turn one. But 
Um, but yeah, without knowing exactly what was said before, if it was kind of a case of, you know, go out there and, and race hard and it's the usual um, situation between drivers where they can race as much as they want, then um, yeah, I don't think there's much of an argument to have. But um, but yeah, I think Carlos should be going out there and uh, in every opportunity trying to get ahead of Sharp because it might add a little bit of extra money onto the many contracts he seems to be negotiating at once <laughs> to uh, decide his future for next year. Yeah, and I, yeah, I completely agree. Like, if you're science right now, you're staring down the barrel of at least two fairly bad seasons, aren't you? In terms of the options he has, like, regardless, like we know Alpine have kind of maybe started to push for him as well. Williams, and you're going to have to be at Salbo in 25 before it becomes Audi. You've got you you've got no good options in front of you. So there's that frustration that clearly, you know, we sometimes talk to his cousin who is his agent, and you know, you mm-hmm. get a sense of the frustration that the family, the family are feeling about the situation he's in. But what I find fascinating about that little, you know, and I think there were a lot of emotions on both sides. But if Charles is that upset about that happening, I mean, what's he going to be like when Lewis is there next year? I mean, Lewis is going to race him as hard as he's ever been raced, I think, before he's going to be a new team. You know, we've always seen that Lewis is, you know, as as when he gets into those positions, he is like, this is what I'm doing and I'm I'm in the right about it. Um, so, yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. And Charles had a weird weekend as well because... If you cast your mind back 24 hours before that, it kind of got lost because Lando got pole. And, but he had mm-hmm. that weird moment in final practice where he was actually behind Lando. Lando, I think, backed out kind of late, got off the racing line. Charles then bailed out of his lap and then kind of just drove sideways into Lando. They made contact. The, the stewards didn't actually do anything about it. But it was just a weird, it was just a weird thing to see. And um, Lando was pretty surprised he didn't get a penalty. So I don't know, Charles just kind of in a weird... Yeah, you know, he mm-hmm. had that win in Monaco, and then he was so frustrated in Canada. It's like yeah. all of the goodwill that he he kind of generated within himself has just been sucked away again by Ferrari. So weird, weird weekend. And again, if you're Charles, you're, you're you're watching ahead and you're seeing this target that seemed completely unreachable a couple of months ago, and suddenly McLaren are right there and potentially have even taken a step ahead, and suddenly out of nowhere as well, Mercedes have have, have suddenly become a viable team. So I mm-hmm. think that there's I think there's deeper frustrations than just oh, Carlos overtook me at turn one. I think that if you're Charles right now, you're looking at it and you're like, all right, well, why aren't we doing that? Because mm-hmm. we should be at, maybe, you know, we were level with McLaren at one point and we were definitely ahead of Mercedes at one point. And now we seem to be kind of maybe slipping down the order. So yeah, yeah I think there's a lot there and that's going to be one to keep an eye on, I think, as we get into this kind of, what's it now, four races in five weeks before the break. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that Alpine has entered the chat in terms of maybe vying for Carlos Sainz and getting him to come join the team um, next season because Alpine uh, is yet again in the headlines. Flavio Briatore has rejoined the team, um, which I think is is interesting, Laz. And I don't know if it signals by having him come back a lack of confidence in current team leadership. I don't know if bringing him back is maybe a choice of goodwill to signal to somebody like Carlos Sainz that we are going to, right the ship we are going to turn things around and start heading in the right direction what was the logic behind this decision do you think uh it's it's hard to know and i think it's a very controversial <laughs> decision because flavio briatore for all the power and intelligence and all the rest of it that he may have within the sphere of formula one he was also the guy who masterminded the 2008 crash gate scandal where he basically instructed one of his drivers to crash so that the other would be would gain an advantage and go on to win the race. And the driver he instructed to crash was Nelson Piquet Jr. And the driver that won the race was Fernando Alonso. And he's still Fernando Alonso's manager, by the way, and has been for a while. So he's been in and around F1 anyway. He was initially given a lifetime ban for his involvement mm-hmm. in that incident. That was then overturned in 2010 when uh, I think he threatened to take it a little bit legal beyond the FIA's uh, remit. So, um, so the... In theory, yeah, you know, he's been back and around F1 for a long time anyway. What difference does it make that he comes back at Alpine? I just think it's it's a real kind of slip and almost like a last resort situation for Alpine now. Uh, because to bring back someone who is synonymous with the most uh, shameful period of Renault's time in Formula 1 and put him right back top and centre of the team... Uh, obviously has some issues that go along with it. Now, you know, I mean, I'm sure people could point a lot of fingers at different people in Formula One and say that they aren't paradigms of moral virtue, but still, you know, um, you, you've got to wonder what, what, what the logic is there. I, I guess if you look at the other side of it now, 
well, Briatore is someone who has won championships with that team, 2005, 2006, with it even further uh, before or or longer uh, before in um, 94, 95, when it was Benetton. Uh, He was at the helm there and um, he does have this knack and this ability to build winning teams, to put the right people in the right place, probably to um, imbue some confidence in, in a workforce. So I guess that's the reason. And also perhaps someone who can look at the situation and strip away all the bullshit, um, for want of a better word, which is which is often what a team needs. And I don't want to compare him to Nicky Lauda because I think they're very different individuals. But if he comes in and can do what Nicky Lauda used to do at Mercedes, which was basically assess a problem and give people a very straight answer, um, perhaps something that Helmut Marco also does at Red Bull, then that is valuable to a team. So, you know, if you can come in and do that, then maybe there's this other theory that because he's this, you know, very successful businessman who's been involved in a lot of massive deals here and there inside F1, outside of F1, that perhaps he's coming in and basically preparing the team to be sold. Everything that Alpine have said publicly is that the team is not for sale. That's not on the agenda. That's not what they're planning to do. But um, that's certainly a theory that has that has risen up as a result of, of, of Briatore being appointed back into a position mm-hmm. of power of that team. And and another theory I heard along that line is if it's not to sell the team, it kind of, there were a couple of people I spoke to, you know, quite in the know about it, that say, well, this pretty much confirmed to them that uh, Alpine will, or Renault as, you know, the, you know, the, the company behind Alpine will stop making their own engines. Obviously, they haven't confirmed that, but that's been heavily rumored. And you've got someone like Briatorian yeah. to try and find a deal <clears throat> elsewhere to Lawrence's point about the, the influence he has. So. I think it says a lot. And it's interesting as well because he's he's involved in driver market decisions now. Um and you know, he and Alonso have a, you know, this kind of I, I is it it's not really a driver academy, is it, Lawrence? It's kind of like a they've got like a that karting thing that's got a few drivers of, a, attached to it and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see that. I've got to say, I felt I don't I don't want to say I felt sorry for Famine because I think that his his answers about Briatori were were pretty poor. Um Famine had to sit there in the press conference on Friday when this appointment, I mean, if you read the press release that came out, Bruno Famine for people listening is Alpine's team boss. Um, if you what if you read the press release that came out with Briatori's um announcement, they said all the things he'd be doing, and it basically stopped short of saying the only thing that wasn't on there was he'll sit on the pit wall and he will dictate strategy during a race. It was very much like he's the executive advisor to the team. It's very much like he's going to be taking over a lot of the stuff that you would normally give somebody like Fermin. So I think he's been he's been kind of put into his box quite a bit. And again, it it, it it's just another decision that Alpine have made where it's a very unclear structure in terms of power, in terms of decisions and and, and stuff like that. It feels like an eleventh hour change, and I don't know. Obviously, there's there's many factors as to making this change and hire and bringing him back into the fold. But I have to think that it's a late game push to possibly try to. Get Carlos signs to consider coming to Alpine, although I know he's in contract negotiations with multiple teams and considering all options before him at this point. He's the next domino, I think we can all agree, has to fall before other pieces start being put into place for teams in 2025. Last week, we did a silly season prediction <laughs> segment, Nate, that you missed but I will catch you up. We're going to do part two here because I, I think this is an interesting conversation giving Bria Torre, um coming back. When we looked at Mercedes last week, we decided, Laz and I, that Kimi Antonelli was probably the best choice and likely the most likely choice that Mercedes would go with for Lewis Hamilton's seat. Haas, mm-hmm. we felt strongly that Oliver Berman would be one of the two drivers. Williams, we currently believe Carlos Sainz will end up becoming Alex Albon's teammates and signing with Williams for what will be a longer deal than we're maybe used to seeing in formula one. We built a short list for that second seat for Haas. <laughs> okay. So we'll start there because we didn't actually finalize it. Laz, we said to be Oliver Berman's teammate would be likely a veteran. K mag could stay or they could go get Esteban Ocon. I said Valtteri Botas might be a good choice and a good teammate as a vet next to Oliver Berman. Would you pick one of those three drivers for that second seat, or were you going to muddy the water and throw somebody else's name in the hat? The problem is, there's not many <clears throat> experienced F1 drivers to pick from, is there? If you look, mm-hmm. actually look at the the available pool from those three, I would. The thing is, 
with Ocon, I think. I don't know if anyone's ever damaged their reputation as quickly as Ocon has this year. Just and, and, and when I say damage his reputation, I still think people think he's a very talented driver, but there's now questions about what comes with him. And I think I think Haas, I think they want him, right? So I would pick I would pick Ocon. And I'd like to see him get away from that Alpine situation and whatever. Yeah. My left field choice wouldn't be Bottas. And as much as I love K Mag, I think, you know, I I just don't think K Mag's delivering anymore. I just given the fact that he's he's done very well with Ferrari and the WEC side of things, and he's still got that Ferrari link. I was just thinking about it the other day because I'm trying to get an interview with him. I'd love to see Giovinazzi come back and have a go with that team. Always kind of like Giovinazzi. I don't know. Great I'm hair. not sure he's I'm not sure he's you know, I'm not saying he's some mega talent and he's definitely doesn't tick that box of experience, but I just he just popped into my head. And this is one of the issues that a lot of teams have now. So talking to a few people in the paddock again on, in, in, over the Spanish Grand Prix, the driver market now has become a real uh, a real struggle for a lot of these teams, especially when they're in the position that Haas are in. Mm-hmm. Because Kevin Magson, to your point, Katie, described um, science as the cork in the... Well, I think he was actually... It was put to him, is science the cork in the bottle holding everything up? And he said, yes, he is the cork in the bottle. And then everyone, including myself, attributed the, the quote to K-Mag on mass. Um, it's called a leading but- question. Yeah, a leading question, and K Mag fell straight into it and gave us a great quote off the back of it. Um, but it's 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 difficult because if you're Haas, you know you've got a guy like Ocon there, but he's waiting to see what Science does. Because if Science doesn't go to Audi, then suddenly Audi are in that position where they're like, well, we need an experienced driver, we need someone there. They've obviously, you know, Bottas could still be in the mix there. So yeah, it it it, it is a weird driver market this year. And um, I would so to go back and answer the question, I'd say Ocon, but I'd say why not just give let's just let's just stick Gio in the car, um, but then. I don't know if I'd take Gio over Behrman either. So maybe I'm already I'm already talking myself out of my my backup choice. It wasn't that good. Okay. Or well, uh, just for our American listeners, why not why not stick Joseph Newgarden in there? He's won two Indy five hundreds now. Um I'd like to see him. Now you're like legit muddying the water at this point. Now I'm just now I'm just throwing names in. But I've always I, I Lawrence disagrees with me on this about more IndyCar drivers coming to F one, but I'd just like to see them try at least. I'd like to see that see that happen. So um yeah, Newgarden as the left field one instead of Giovinazzi. I will not move forward with asterisks like last time, Laz. So I'm putting the decision to you. Giovinazzi or Ocon for the second seat for Haas? Oh, Ocon was my lead pick. Ocon was my lead pick. The other two were kind of, they can be reserve drivers. Okay, so can we agree? Giovinazzi also, I think, is doing a great job in the Ferrari WEC team. I think he's found found the place where he is properly suited to... um, to that and while you could see that as a stepping ball back, I, I don't think it is. I think it's a completely different career, personally. And I think that's well, what would be best for him. Like a couple of years at has like where he, you know he gets shown up by Ben. Well, I don't know. It doesn't yeah, make sense. That's true. But that's Ocon, true. absolutely. Ocon is, I think, the 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 best choice that has can bring in. I think, you know, there's a lot of this stuff about the, you know, the rough edges of his personality and everything. I think a lot of that comes down to uh, the situation he's in now at Alpine. Um, clearly, you know, he's an absolute fighter, but there'll be times when that really works well for you. You know, this this, this kind of edge of him is, is double-sided. There'll be times when he'll do stuff and grind out a result that just wouldn't be possible without that kind of real mental resilience and mm. um, and stubbornness in, in certain circumstances. So I would say, if you know, if I was Ayo Komatsu at Haas, I would be just trying to get Ocon to sign that deal as soon as possible, get him locked in, and then you don't need to worry about the drive market. You can pull yourself out of it. I don't think it's as easy as that because of all the reasons we've been talking about, science making his decision first, Ocon weighing up the potential possibilities after that, that that, that, that will leave open either Sauber or, um, or, or Williams. But I think, yeah, Ocon would actually do quite well at Haas, and I think Haas would be very sensible to try and get his his signature. And it does seem like he is top of the list. And what just to, just mm-hmm. as a quick note on the driver market, what was very interesting in Spain was that Williams, from every conversation I had, did think on Thursday they would have been making an announcement. That was kind of the chat. And a lot of people were saying it's happening on Wednesday. A lot of people tweeted it's mm-hmm. happening tomorrow. And Thursday, they were still like, well, maybe it's happening Friday. From everything I was told, Williams did, they were like, yeah, we're going to be putting something out. And then when it got to Friday and they didn't have a decision, they said we're not doing anything Saturday, Sunday because it's just not fair on Sergeant. You know, you can't have him going into a qualifying session and it's like, oh, we've just signed, you know, signs or you know, whoever it would be. So um 
So that's worth thinking about for this week coming up in Austria. If we don't have a decision by Friday, it might not be that we... I mean, it might be that the, the timing has forced people's hands now and they have to do that, but I just thought that was quite an interesting insight into the comms side of announcing a driver as well, that sometimes the teams are like, well, yeah, we think... Like the guys that me and Lawrence talked to the most, like, yeah, I thought it was coming today. And then obviously things happen away from... You know, behind what do you doors. think happened? What would have disrupted that possible announcement? I think... I think Sainz literally is. It, I mean, he he's he said it in the press conference. He, I just think he just can't make his mind up. I think he's he's, I think he's had so long to think about it. I think he's thought too too long and hard about it, because the thing is with the options he's got is he's basically got three what if decisions to make, hasn't he? He knows what the short term is for all of them, and you've kind of got to make up the rest and be like, I think this could happen. I think this could happen. I think this could happen. And, and the short term um, isn't great in any of those circumstances yeah, as well. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. E exactly. So. I think I think he's just had too much time to think about it. And I feel for him because it's not a situation a driver of his talent deserves to be in. Mm -hmm. Um and I think what I'll say is I think I think I still think he'll pick Williams. Um I think that's what people closer to him are advising him to do. Um if you actually look at the deals, it sounds like Williams's deal, he'd be able to get out of it sooner. Audi want him committed very, very long term. They want to make him the face of the project, which is great money wise. It's just great status wise. But if Audi turns out to be a complete dud, you're stuck there. So now was Williams real quick. Too. Was Williams a three year deal, two year with a one year option? Well, that seemed like I've, a longer deal, I thought. I've heard different things. I think okay. it's definitely a multi year deal. But what it might be is somebody described it as a one plus one plus one where you basically have two option years. They expect you'll take the second, but the, mm -hmm. I suppose the subtext of that would be much easier to get out of if, let's say after a year, you absolutely destroy uh, Albon for the season. Another team comes knocking. You're like, yep, I'm out of here. See you later. That's kind of what I was led to believe in, in Spade. And that does sound like, you know, that is the case out of those and deals. The, the other thing they can work into these contracts is performance clauses. So yep. if Williams go into next year and he has, like a performance clause where, you know, they need to be within whatever it is of the front of the grid or get an X amount of points per year. And the car just isn't capable of it in 2025, which is entirely possible. If he just sets up performance clause quite high, he gives himself a, an exit. But I think for science realistically, I mean, the decision you're making now for the reasons you point out, Nate, it's not about 2025. It's about, yeah. you know, where the best place to be for 26. And if you look around, most of the other top teams or the top teams that he would love to be at, are fairly nailed down for 26. Now we know that can change. We know Max Verstappen could, you know, up sticks and go somewhere else and all this kind of stuff. But I think that's looking increasingly less likely, uh, you know, as we get to this stage of the year. So I think he wouldn't be badly placed to sign a two-year contract, see through that first year of 26. Because of course, if you make a decision at the end of 25 to leave, say, Williams and go to, I don't know, wherever the place comes up, what if it all changes around in, 26 and you've made the wrong decision so i think realistically whichever decision he makes for next year will also be for 26 and then you want that opportunity at the end of 26 to have options and also be able to negotiate with people right from the off as soon as it's clear who's good in 26 you'll be able to open yep. negotiations and not be hamstrung by any date or anything like that that keeps you from talking to other people first we have three other teams that we have to be able to pick and make predictions sauber is one of them Alpine, we need two seats, and VCARB is the last team that we're going to make our predictions for. Sauber is one of those teams that's vying for Carlos Sainz, so I just think let's go there. Laz, make your pick. Well, I think if you're Sauber team principal, you're absolutely still trying to convince Carlos Sainz. Yeah, but you already gave Carlos Sainz to Williams. Okay, Last so... He's so off the table. We're, we're, we're okay, we're, we're now in that point of the uh, situation where yes. science is gone okay yes. in that situation i'd probably i'd probably look to stick with valtteri i mean it might be i a knew i knew i knew it'd be valtteri i i but, agree but i could see i could see the, the twinkle in lawrence's eye when he knew he could say valtteri well one because <laughs> i want to make sure it makes valtteri sense stays in f1 I, I don't want him yeah. leaving f1 right now i think he's still got stuff to give and um yeah i think if you're looking for just a the most solid experienced in some ways boring but you know ensure you'll get good results and also get a hint of the performance of the car lineup from where the Sauber Audi project is now you could do a lot worse than Hulkenberg and Bossas so that would be my choice do you co-sign Nathaniel I do 
I do. Okay. Well, that one was easy, guys. Well done. Okay, Valtteri mm-hmm. Bottas to Sauber. All right, let's go V-carb next because we've got two for Alpine that we got to fill. Well, I think everyone knows what I'm going to say for this one. Um, this is, I mean, this is a straight pick, right? It's Ricardo or Lawson. Um, I was, weirdly, I was actually talking to Lawson about, he posted a video of him in a studio, like singing an acoustic version of Times Like These by the Foo Fighters, which sounded great. And I said to him, I was like, are you putting that out as an album? He's like, no, no, I just do that in my spare time. But it looked like he was recording something. Anyway. I would pick, I don't know what to do here because I still think Ricardo's got something to give in Formula One, but I also think the point of that team, the point of the Red Bull Junior team should be that. You should be promoting the younger talent. And, you know, Lawson was pretty good, wasn't he, last year when he came in? I mean, we only had a small sample size. Um. So, yeah, I mean, I'll let Lawrence say Lawson. I'll say Ricardo, and I'll let, I'll let Lawrence have have some balls and actually kick kick Ricardo out because <laughs> I don't have him. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't. I just can't do it to Danny. Raz, right. do you got the balls? You gonna kick wow. him out? So the problem is, if you're gonna be nasty here as a team principal, you can probably assume that Lawson isn't gonna go anywhere else if you don't take up the option. Yeah, and you can That's true. play that kind of, you know, slight game of risk where you're like, well, you know. We'll put Ricardo in and then look, it's not beyond it's very much RB's modus operandi to to kick someone out uh midway for a season. So you keep that there. But I think all of this depends on, and this is such a cop-out answer, but it depends on Ricardo's performances up until the summer break. And I think this is actually how yeah. RB are looking at this as well. They're not in a rush. They've got two options. I'm not okay. sure when this option on Lawson expires, but I would have thought they'd at least have until the summer break. Um so you basically turn around to Ricardo, you say, look, you've got to start performing, you know, really top level from now on, beating Yuki. And if you do that, you're staying. If you don't, then we go with, you know, we go with Lawson and we see Lawson up for the end of the year. But then if you're making that decision, is it worth just bringing Lawson in before the end of the year? It's tough. Hmm. So whichever way you do it, you're being brutal to one of them, aren't you? So I, yeah. because me and Nate have failed to give, well, Nate's given an answer, but because I failed to give an answer, <laughs> Casey, I'm going to throw it to you. And you're going yeah, to have that's a good point. That's a good Daniel point. Ricardo or Liam Lawson. Basically, both of us showed responsibility on to the next person. We didn't have the balls to do it ourselves. Is well, it brutal principles. though? I mean, it's. I think it's brutal. I'm of two thoughts. Is it brutal for a young rookie to have to wait and buy his time for his moment? What's one more year in the grand scheme of things? Like Liam Lawson is going to have an F1 career, and I would hope a great one at that or a good one at that. Um, so part of me thinks you just hold Daniel Ricardo if he does well, to your point, last to summer break, as a placeholder. You pick up his option. And then if it doesn't work out in the next year, then you move on to Liam Lawson because you've already got that infrastructure set up. But in terms of being shrewd, how many chances does somebody get in Formula One mm. before you move on? And, and also, I would sorry, wonder that just... about Ricardo. Sorry, Kate. I, and also, I just wonder what the next step would be with Ricardo as well. Like, you know, I don't think now Red Bull see him as. I think when they brought him back, I think genuinely they thought this can mm-hmm. put some pressure under Perez, and maybe he's there. But I just think now they've looked at it and they're like, all right, well, that's probably not the way we'd go in that situation. I don't know too, and like we we have this conversation often is like, how much does the markability of a person outweigh the results on track? And we all know that he's a very capable driver. He proved that. Where did he finish P4? Was that Miami? Or I'm trying to think he finished qualifying. Uh, P5. Qualified P4 in Miami Sprint and then P5 in Canada qualifying. Yeah, so. P8. Pretty solid you, results there. That right. And so his if performances you can, have got better, right? That like since that start spell when he was really doing badly. I think he's. I think he's much better now than he was. Yeah, he, he got a new chassis in China and there was still a debate over whether that whether there's anything wrong with the original one, but it certainly changed something inside him. And yeah, the really quite underwhelming performances from the very start of the year kind of disappeared and and he did start to put in semi-decent ones. But I've yet to see anything where you're like, wow, he's a step ahead of Yuki Tsunoda. And I think that kind of has to be the benchmark. I think Tsunoda is mm-hmm. very, very good, but it's become clear as well that Red Bull probably aren't, teeing him up for a long-term future there. So if you can't beat Sonoda, the guy that they are so reluctant to move up through <laughs> the system, because if, you, if you'd if you ask, like, you know, who's who's the guy that deserves to be Max Sappen's teammate from all the drivers under the Red Bull contracts right now? I would say Sonoda, based mm. on yeah. this season. Same. But that's not happening. So, yeah, if you, can't, if you can't beat him, then you're like, well, 
what 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 is he bringing to the table? But and here's a controversial opinion, which is going to move the conversation on slightly to the next one. What if Daniel Ricciardo could go to Alpine and be Pierre Gasly's teammate, deprive another young driver of his opportunities to make <laughs> step one in the form of Jack Doohan? <laughs> I oh, that's interesting. You think he returns? I, I I don't think he does. I'm, this is not based on yeah. anything I've heard in the paddock whatsoever. But sure. I'm just putting it out there as a, a hypothetical way to solve our, our Daniel Ricciardo dilemma. Okay, I know I'm splitting this. Do we all feel like Alpine will stick with Pierre Gasly as one of their two drivers? Yeah, yeah, and, unless he can be convinced to go somewhere go else. Elsewhere, okay. But um, but I'm I think it's, there's you know some logic to that. Of course, I think Audi wouldn't be completely against the idea of of Gasly coming in, and they may actually see that as a much more interesting option mm. than than Valtteri because he's that bit younger. I think he's. You know, it's a different type of marketability, but you know, um, you, you could argue that as well. But anyway, I, that's, I think that's you're at this. Further. We're going back to the south. It is, but I, it's interesting <laughs> because I think we're at this precipice with some of these drivers where <laughs> you have to question what is the ceiling. Where do you go from here with some of these older, more veteran drivers being Valtteri Bottas? You could say the same for Kevin Magnussen. I think you could throw Daniel Ricciardo into that grouping as well. Of if we stick with them how high is the ceiling? What kind of result are we going to be able to get? And back to the Daniel Ricardo, I do feel like he's shown more consistency over the last handful of races than we've seen from him in a while. And so if he's able to maintain that consistency to summer break and beyond it, I think if you're, if you're V carb, you stick with him and stick with the lineup that you have. Um, and then you have Liam Lawson waiting in the wing. So I'm going to make that decision for V carb to throw it down. Now you two, to move us along in this podcast, have to give me two drivers for Alpine or at least one if you think Pierre Gasly will stay. I'm going to say <clears throat> Gasly does stay, and I'll keep this one quick. I think that somewhere in Al uh, Alpine, the uh, sorry, that Enstone, the Alpine factory, there's got to be a picture of Oscar Piastri that says never again underneath it. We can't ever let a young talent get away from us. They have, we don't know how good he is. I mean, he didn't, win, he didn't have the same junior career as, as Piastri. But you've got Jack Doohan in there. Um, and, you, and you've also got Mick Schumacher, who both guys are doing a test next week at Alpine. I think if they're keeping Gasly, my feeling is they'll go for one of those guys in the second seat. I Now, I don't know. I'm getting from Lawrence's reaction that maybe not. But the thing is there, I just think that like if, if you're that team, the position you're in, you know, you've got you've got young drivers like Doohan there. You might as well see what you've got in them. If they're not very good, you can get rid of them after a year. I don't think it will have cost you a championship or anything like that. So I would probably say take a punt on doing, keep Gasly, and then you've got a nice, interesting lineup there for the year. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the way it seems to be going at the moment. Okay. I think they're probably a bit reluctant to commit to doing it until they know they've got Gasly 100% mm. locked in because um, you know I think that's the order that they need to sort that out. They need to make sure they get one very good experienced driver locked in and then worry about about the second one but you know it's 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 not a you know i, I think doing uh seems to be good i don't think there's anything that suggests he's exceptional but then um he has been a part of that team for a, you know for a long time now and as a junior uh he's involved in simulator work he gets it you know in terms of just coming in and getting the job done uh, in 2025, and you know, considering your options after that, I think he's a he's, he's a pretty good a pretty good shout. And because Alpine are in this position now, where you know they aren't the most desirable team um, by, by by some shot, they're they're getting some decent results together now. But they're still you know fairly down the order of of, of where drivers want to end up, just because of the mess it has been over the last mm -hmm. two years. Um, I think there's probably something sensible to say: just take your junior driver. Give them a chance, like Nate said. Don't let them, you know, go away and and be better somewhere else. And uh, yeah, and then you know, if the contracts are kept fairly open, then you can you can always make changes down the line. Who would you rather see? Teams aside, who would you rather see on the grid next year? Jack Doohan or Liam Lawson? Oh, that's a good one. For me, Liam Lawson. I think uh, based on what we've seen already, uh, I think. Lawson, when he came in and, and replaced Ricardo for those races last year, showed that he is F1 standard. You know, I think on a level that, you know, 
in a similar kind of vein to, to, to what Behrman did. I, I, I'm not yet deciding which one's better. I think Be- Behrman's probably got more overall potential long term. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, right now Lawson can come in and do a job. Uh, and that's kind of a bit of fun doing because I haven't seen it. But yeah, based on what I've seen, then it would be Lawson. You would agree? Yeah, same here. If only we had like an 11th team or something, you know. Where, where oh, we can, ah, yeah. Like That's what we have too team. many good drivers and not enough yeah. spots on the grid. Okay, here is how the predictions, just to recap, have played out. Now, obviously, if a domino falls or something massive changes, we will adjust these as we get closer to silly season and summer break. But as of last week, we said Mercedes was going to sit with Kimi Antonelli. Haas was going to take Oliver Berman as well as Esteban Ocon. Williams was going to sign Carlos signs the prize mayor in this entire thing. Prize mayor, that seems like a really old statement to make, but you all get what I'm saying. Alpine is going to stick with Pierre Gasly <laughs> and Jack Dewan. Sauber will remain with Valtteri Botas, and VCarb is going to ride high with Daniel Ricardo. Do you guys feel strongly about the predictions we've just made? Strong. I like that. Pretty good. I, I mean, the interesting thing is, I'm not convinced. Well, I'm convinced by some of them. But not all of them. So yeah, we still There's got to be movement ahead of us. This yeah. isn't obvious. This isn't obviously the way it's going to play out. Uh, yeah. There's a few there which you could see absolutely changing. And then if one piece changes, then all the others mm-hmm. have to change behind it. So mm-hmm. if science doesn't go to Williams and he goes to Salva, then all of a sudden everything else kind of just moves around that little bit. Um, so I think that's what will make it interesting and keep me and Nate busy over the next few weeks. And if you know anything about us as predictors on this show, then uh, you know that we're going to get some of them wrong. Um, guarantee. We should have just given them all to you this week, Katie. The role you're on right now, we should have said, right, you're doing this. I don't think that I'm ever going to be able to replicate what I did uh, for Spain. <laughs> Speaking of, who's going to Austria this weekend? That would be me. That would be Perhaps. you. Okay. So sprint weekend in Austria. I'll ask you about the track. How do you think that it'll play out in a sprint format? Yes. Yeah, so... I think the sprint format works quite well in Austria because you can overtake. Mm-hmm. And also it's a really exciting track to have a qualifying session on because there's only nine corners, uh, seven of which of those are proper corners and not just kinks in the straight as well. So what you end up having is is qualifying sessions divided by, you know, not even tenths of a second, hundreds of seconds, thousands mm-hmm. of a second. And with it being as competitive as it is right now in Formula One, you'll generally go there not knowing who is going to come out on top. And then even if Red Bull do look quicker at the end of uh, the first practice session and we go into that sprint qualifying, um, one mistake in one of those seven corners, you know, dropping a tenth and a half, two tenths, that can be enough to to drop you not just from pole position, but perhaps down to six on the grid. So I think um, this is actually going to be a really fun exciting weekend it's a really cool track anyway um the location is just unique in formula one there's nowhere else where we go racing in the mountains and then it's just this fun little track that yeah it does promote overtaking um up at turn uh three and turn four uh two really obvious places so um yeah i'm genuinely looking forward to it a lot of rain in the forecast okay so take your rain jacket or borrow nates if you need with that <laughs> Our current podium prediction standings look like this. Katie leads 13 points. Nathaniel, 12 points in second place. Laz, third place with nine points. Because you're going and because you're in last place at the moment, for now, (laughs) I will give you the first choice of your podium predictions for Austria. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a a good thing or not to to go first. I'm going to say, because I think it's going to be really mixed up, George Russell in third place. Max Verstappen in second place. Ooh. And Lando Norris. <gasps> Whoa. Is the race Some redemption. Yeah. I dig it. So you feel like Mercedes will still be able to continue its momentum of good form the last two races? I think so. Um, you know, the signs are that the car is pretty good in high-speed corners. Um, and I feel like it's, yeah, it's kind of track that, that could still suit them. Uh, I'm not, you know, not convinced. F- Ferrari might work out if, you know, uh, there's a bit of curb riding there, which is a Ferrari strength. But yeah, I, I think Ferrari have, have kind of dropped a little bit in the high-speed corners, and I think that might be where Mercedes mixed up. But you could choose any of the eight drivers from those four teams, and it wouldn't be a ridiculous no. choice. So over to you guys to do just that. Nate, lay it um, on us. 
Mine's going to be similar to Lawrence's. I'm going to say Lewis in third. I think I think Spain was quite an important result for him, you know, get getting just back into that groove. And then, yeah, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to say Max in second and, and Lando winning. I think McLaren in Austria will be be very, very strong. And I think Lando's coming to the weekend with a bit of a fire in his belly, given the fact that he thinks he should have won last time out. Okay, so I'm going to go with... Charles Leclerc in third. I don't know. That feels like even Lando Norris in second because it's so lame and boring. But now that I've tasted power, now that I've tasted winning, well, this is it. You're you're doing the smart thing and putting Max first. I assume. Um, yes, nailed which, it. Which which is you you've got a winner's mindset there, Katie. You're like Lando in the race. Me and me and me and Lawrence are like, oh, you've got to cover off Lewis in third, and you're like Lando. Like, no, no, we got to go win the race. We, you know, I know, we, but we we, we want to go win it. I don't know if I want to see this come. Like, obviously, for our show and our prediction scoring, <laughs> I want this to happen. But I don't know if I want to see it happen as a fan. So that's why I always get torn. All right. As always, thank you both. Welcome back from jury duty. Thank you for um, being a great citizen and doing your duties to your country. I'm sure that that was much appreciated. <laughs> Laz, safe travels. Have so much fun in Austria. And we'll be back next week to break down all things... Austrian Grand Prix and get you ready for Silverstone. Cheers. <laughs>